Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming. My name is Bernard. I'm a bookseller here at Politics and Prose. On behalf of the owners and of the staff, I'd like to welcome all of you for this evening's event. As you may already know, Politics and Prose hosts hundreds of in-person events along with our partnered events, supported events, trips, and classes. Um, some of our events are now being held at our newly relocated branches at the Wharf and Union Market. Um, so please uh, check our website for a full list. A little bit of housekeeping before we start. First of all, please uh, turn off or silence your cell phone so as not to disturb um, the event. For the Q&A, please remember to step up to the microphone over here before asking your questions over here by the pillar. Um, we are selling uh, the book behind the cash registers or at the cash registers um, at the front of the store. So if you'd like to get a copy, um, you can get it there. We will be doing a signing after the Q&A. So if you'd like to get your book signed, please sign up also by the pillar over here. Um, we will be coming to you in case you ne uh, need personalizations for your book. So please have your books ready for us. Lastly, after the event, please um, fold up your chairs and lean them against something sturdy if you can so that, you know, to help us out a bit. I'm honored to introduce uh, Tricia Rose to all of you. Professor Rose is Chancellor's Professor of Africana Studies and the Director of the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America at Brown University. She has written three books, including The Hip Hop Wars, has received fellowships from the Ford and Rockefeller Foundations, and her research has been funded by the Mellon and Robert Wood Johnson Foundations. Tonight, she'll be talking about her new book, Meta Racism, How Systemic Racism Devastates Black Lives. In this thought-provoking work of scholarship, Professor Rose defines what systemic racism is, its effects on all aspects of society, and how we can fight it. In their starred review of the book, Publishers Weekly writes, marshalling extensive evidence into a lucid and powerful narrative, Rose provides an essential new look at American inequality. Even readers well-versed in the topic will have their eyes opened by this cogent analysis. Tonight, she'll be in conversation with Rashad Robinson. He is the president of Color of Change, a racial justice organization with more than 7 million members who demonstrate the power of black community, communities every single day. He also regularly serves as a keynote speaker at events across the country, won a Webby Award for Best Political Podcast, has been a speaker at roundtables convened by both Oprah Winfrey and President Obama, has received several other awards, and, and has authored several published works related to social change. Everyone, let us all welcome Trisha Rose and Rashad Robinson. How we doing? Good. All right. Well, first off, I just um, want to say congratulations, Tricia. This Thank is you. such an incredible achievement. Um, what you've done through storytelling, deep research, and um, and case studies, um, it just gives us a lot of tools to mm -hmm. um, dig in deeper to so many of the conversations, the questions, mm -hmm. the the challenges that we face in our society, and hopefully will spark um, new opportunities for us to be able to do better and be better. Thank and you. Thank you, um, sure. yeah, and so I guess I want to start off, and, and I, I definitely want you to do some reading from the book, but I had the title, Meta Racism. Right, yeah, you're yeah. sort of introducing uh, a term and a phrase, and I'd I'd love for you to sort of help us understand uh, meta racism. Yeah, yeah. No, I know. There's a there's a little tiny essay in that yes, title. Yes. Um, but for tonight, I'll just first I'm going to read the epigraph, which is the definition, because I realized if I just use this title and don't offer a definition, first of all, people will be all panicky. It's like there's more racism, you know, <laughs> um, and and yes and no. It's a little bit more complex, and then I'll, I'll give a description about what I mean. So meta racism, which is the meta effect of systemic racism is the dynamic and compounding patterns of racial disadvantage and discrimination produced by the interconnections among policies and practices across society over time. And so there's no single policy that produces meta-racism or even systemic racism. Um, and that um, meta-racism is by definition 
more impactful than the sum of the parts of the system, okay? This is basic 101 systems analysis, right? But it was very important to me to use this term, but also to draw our attention to how systems work right away, because we really are not very clear about that, right? We use systems and structures interchangeably, and they're not interchangeable. And so I'll tell more of the story if, if you want me to do it now. Well, about actually, actually help us understand what yeah. the difference is. Yeah, yeah. there's, there's yeah. a huge difference. And again, I started this with sort of structure system. You know, you just kind of use them inter, inter, you know, uh, just un, in an undistinguished way. And then I started reading very carefully. I read almost every article I could find on systemic or structural racism. You know, from you know, mostly sociologists, but not just sociologists. And I realized a lot of really amazing people were using them pretty loosely. Like structure was system, system was structure. Very few people cited system theory when they used the word system. Mm -hmm. And they pretty much meant things like there's a lot of built-in stuff going wrong in society. It was a very loose term. And I started, so I started with structure, and then when I started teaching it, there's nothing like teaching to straighten you out. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, okay, this is not making sense to me. It's not enough. So I, you know, I started studying policies individually because I thought, okay, it's a structure. It should be built in everywhere. And that's when I realized this really is a system, not just a structure. And so I started talk, reading systems theory carefully and realized this is the effect and the, and the relationships that define what's happening now. And so at that point, I abandoned structure, which only means that I wanted to be more precise. Structures can be a lot of things. They don't have to be systems. In fact, they're usually not. Mm -hmm. So you could say, uh, you know, any given organization could have, say a, 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 say, a leadership span that produces a lot of racism in their organization, and that would be a structure. You could say, remember when Denny's had some big racism mm -hmm. problem? Mm -hmm. Like, you would remember everybody, yes. Rashad. Every, every <laughs> <laughs> it's like a walking uh, dictionary of every possible. <laughs> anyway, so Denny's had some troubles. But is Denny's systemic racism? Yes. No, De Denny's is structural yes. racism to yes. me. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it's not built in to, in the way that I just described it over you know, a long period of time producing meta effects. Mm -hmm. So as I started really looking into that, I saw that the policies and practices in the post-civil rights era, not legacies of slavery, but the policies since the 1980s, were generating systemic racism that was newly being formed by this interaction and interconnections of elements of policy that were, were um, deployed in racist ways while colorblind in their official language. And that's when I was like, oh, okay. We really need to drill down here. So that's that's how I got to that. You know, this is this is such an so important. You said so many things, and I definitely want to drill down right on the focus of post-civil rights. Mm -hmm. Because I think that that's really important in terms of what you're engaging and talking about in the book. I mean, so many of the sort of uh, conversations and debates we're having, especially when we're talking about sort of how to repair mm -hmm. uh, for past harms, mm -hmm. uh, harken back and talk yeah. about slavery. And then we end up with the automatic mm -hmm. uh, responses, well, that happened so many generations ago. I wasn't here. Or my people weren't even here. My right. people didn't own slaves. Um, mm -hmm. And so how can I be responsible? Yeah. And so. Talk a little bit about sort of your research process mm -hmm. and sort of digging into nearly a, basically almost 100 yeah. policies, right, post-civil rights right. Yeah. Um, that really um, sort of illustrate what you're talking about. Right, right. So, you know, one of the things I've, I've always worked at, my work has always been about the post-civil rights era. You know, my work on hip-hop was post-civil rights, the sexuality, oral history was post-civil rights. Um, and, uh, and you know, other popular culture work. So what, what always interested me about the racial politics of post-1970s era was that this is the first time you have, to, yeah, on the cultural side, it's the first time you have black popular culture in the mainstream arena, right? That's, the, that's why that was really interesting to me. Like, it wasn't segregated radio, it was pop music. And that's the first period in, in American history, right? The other thing that happened is that it's the first time you have a majority of whites who would say they themselves do not believe in racial hierarchy and believe in racial equality, right? That's the first time in US history you have a, ma a major majority. And if you ask them, are we an equal society? They'd say 80% would say either yes or pretty close. Now, shockingly, almost 45% of black people say the same thing, but that'll be neither here nor there for the moment. So I started thinking, okay, 
why are they not aware of all this inequality? Why do they think their own personal equality is translating into a national project? And how is it that they're missing this? So I started thinking like, okay, I want people to actually see that it's not equal and then tell me what they think, right? Rather than having this sort of set of assumptions. So that was my first slightly cynical New York approach, which is like, okay, here's all this evidence. But then when I started digging into policies and, and the website I'm working on has health, so some of these are health that are not in the book, but I looked through, you know, obviously stop and frisk, broken windows, uh, t you know, property taxes, funding schools, um, school to prison pipeline, um, the um, hyper punishment and development of suspensions and and uh, 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 expulsions in schools, appraisal discrimination, steering that still goes on. There's a really good documentary about Long Island. Do you know it? Long Island Divided on this, and um, lots and lots of other policies like that. In education, health, I'm sorry, health for the website, wealth, um, criminal justice, and housing. New housing, not just you know redlining in the past. And so looking at all of those, I thought, okay, I'm gonna do it like they always do in, in disciplines in, in, in academia, drill down into the individual policy. So I would look into something like, um, what was the one that had this one with the housing? Um, Post-incarceration sort of policies, people who come out of jail and have you know things that happen. And they have to follow certain rules, and if they don't, they go back, which is like basically everything they might do sends them back. So I would look at these policies and I'd think, okay, this could not produce this level of disparity and, and trouble by itself. But then I started looking at, I said, okay, let's stop, because I had a whole team of, of students who were amazing at Brown, I have to say. Um, and I said, okay, what I want to do is first say, this is what systems say, ask what the, look at what the system says it's going to do, and then ignore that, and look at what the outcome is. And the outcome is the purpose. I was like, okay, so I just followed along. And I said, okay, we'll look at these policies. And then when I said, okay, what is it for? And then how does it impact black people? It was like two different universes in the same page. So it would be about, you know, creating opportunities for post-incarcerated people, but also realizing that they're untrustworthy and shouldn't be given other perks. So what is another perk? Living in, in housing that has subsidy, state or federal government attached to it. So you come out of prison which you've already been targeted for because you're African-American and male, which is proven all over the place. I don't, that's no new thesis. You come out of prison from this experience, and what happens? You can't move in with your mom, your cousin, your aunt, because why? Because they live in subsidized housing, because they've also been poor, and they've all had these other policies that have targeted them. And so if you're caught in those places, your people get thrown out. And if you're not, you have to, what, find a place to live? So you're an African-American with a felony, because everything became a felony after the, <laughs> after the 90s. Okay, I'm exaggerating, but you get my point. You can you turn misdemeanors into felonies if you want. And then they go, and they can't find a place to live. They don't have enough money to live in cities. You saw what happened to all these cities. And they end up where? Homeless. So black men make up you know, 40 to 50% of the homeless population when they're only 6% of the population. And that's why. So when you start pulling those effects that look like they're not related, they're actually incredibly compounding. And I just gave you just one and a quarter. I didn't even, you, that's all I did was one and a quarter there. And there's a million other intersections. So I start thinking like, how are people gonna get out of this? It's like a trap. It's like a trap to a trap to a trap. You know, this sort of, um, you know, goes back, right, to the, the point you were making about uh, the interconnectedness, right? Um, at Color of Change, we say uh, people don't experience issues, we experience life. Right. And, right, we're in an election year, right? And so I will get a lot of questions from reporters that mm -hmm. will say, what is the most important issue for black people, right? And it's like, like how do you even like, answer that question? And they want you to say criminal justice or, right. or something with the economy or voting rights. And they want you to give a, a specific issue that is some sort of like silver bullet issue that, uh, that, that can translate back to a poll. And that if like a politician then says the right things on it, they then in turn will be seen as doing the right thing on behalf of black people. And so the uh, part of, I think, what you're doing is complicating that exactly. in, a, in an era where people don't want things to be complicated. No, I know. That's a, a personality flaw of mine. I'm always on the front end of, no, it's not what you think it is, you know, you, you know, from top, top to bottom. But what you're saying is so important because the main mechanism for 
it's not the mechanism for doing it is one thing. That's a that's a sort of an extension of what I'd call the southern st strategy, right? An articulation of the ever abstraction of 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 the how racism is working until you can't really see it unless you go down into it in a particular way. But the way it hides from us, which is different from the way that it's produced, mm -hmm. is that we begin to tell stories that are almost always about individual actors. So racism becomes a behavior, a personal attitude, a way of thinking, but it is not a systemic matter. Why? Because we, we handled that in the civil rights era. And so by saying that it's illegal to be racist doesn't mean that there's no very limited protection if there is racism. It just means it's not legalized, right? It's not forced apartheid, right? So once that becomes the, the belief that that handled all of the institutional forms of systemic racism that existed, now we just, as long as we keep telling stories in individual ways, we will basically embody this in our behavior. We'll say, yes, we can all agree when those cops in Mississippi do this horrible, heinous form of torture that that's bad. But if you ask well, how, many cop, how many police forces in the United States practice that kind of behavior and which ones in major cities with black people like Chicago have done it for 40 years, now you're having another conversation. So what I did in the second half of the book was say, well, let me tell you three stories you think you know. Trayvon. Martin, Mike Brown, and Kelly Williams Bolar, who was the woman in Ohio who was stealing education, you know, so on and so forth. She's the only one who lived, so people don't remember her <laughs> as much. So, how so, so we all can agree Trayvon probably shouldn't have been stalked, right? We can kind of agree that Mike Brown wasn't supposed to be killed, but that's a little more ambiguous because of the perception of threat that was activated and the fact that he stole cigarillos. I'm talking about mainstream consciousness. But what's missing from all of it in the big picture, some journalists did handle one thing at a time, but the whole picture is totally missing. And it's, they were both in an incredible web of systemic racism. When you really dig into it, it's stunning how, how profound it was. Not just the fact that he was punished, Trayvon was punished in the high school that he should have not been suspended from, but that he was suspended for infractions that do not warrant suspensions. And if you follow his suspensions and his, it's just it's not in any way following the you know crop high rules. When you look at the stop and frisk in in Miami Gardens where he lived with his mom before he went down to see his dad and got killed by Mike Zimmerman, I mean by um Zimmerman George, he was in a in a t area where they were they had one guy who was stopped and frisked 258 times. Okay, the, the, the corner store was so frustrated with the police that they turned their surveillance cameras on the police, not on the brothers in the neighborhood, to, to document the police's behavior, which is why these journalists could find it and see what was happening. So that's what he left. So why would he run from some guy with a gun talking about stop? So, so like that's missing. So there's like over and over and over. Mike Brown, I'll tell you one more quick detail that totally, you know, was just stunning to me. So you know when he was first um, in the news after the, the, the murder, they had pictures of him as a, you know, a thug drinking a 40 ounce on his social feed. And then they had him with a, you know, the whole graduation outfit. And he was a happy, you know, cherubic faced young man, looked like he was going off to college somewhere. So I said, well, where was he going? Does anybody know where he was going to college? Oh, trade. I wish trade. Trade would be great. That would mean he'd have a trade. <laughs> yes, but it was basically a for profit school called Vatterot had 18 campuses around the country. People were being trained in, 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 uh, in fields that did not exist anymore, accrued incredible debt. Everyone, and you look at the numbers, the government shut them down, but where did they go? Black and Latinx communities. They were saturated in communities where young black people wanted some opportunity and were vulnerable to extending themselves on the myth that these were opportunities when they were just predatory extraction factories. That's all they were. So where was he going? Not where we think he was. Now that you know, that's just not to say it's better to be dead. That's awful. I don't mean that. I'm saying though this fantasy that oh, you know, he had a, a bright future, right? And it wouldn't have been so. It wouldn't have been great if this didn't happen. Yes, it would have been great if it didn't happen. But he would have been mired in this process and, and blamed for it, for sure. Why didn't he pay his bills? Why didn't he, you know, do X, Y, and Z? Why didn't he finish school? You know, it would have been all of that story. So. That's what I wanted to unpack for people, that this is hidden and retold in ways that make it very hard to really understand. Yeah. I see a lot of like heads nodding and kind of like, kind of aha. And you know, you had to come to this yeah. all, right? right? I mean, this is 
a process for for so many of us as we um, both seek to better understand and to like and then to think about what we have to do to disrupt. Would you mind reading a little oh, yeah. from the from the books? I know you want to. The passage I think you're picking is kind of part of the 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 discovery yeah, and the right. deep yes. Yes, I mean there are sort of two discovery chapters. I'm going to read from the first one, and then I'll tell you a little bit about the second one quickly. But, and this also reiterates the things that, you know, I'm saying fairly quickly with the hopes that they'll sink in. Okay, this is chapter one called "Caught Up in the System: Meta, Meta Racism and the Stories That Hide It." Listening in on conversations going f uh, on uh, going on around me growing up, there was a phrase I often heard peppered throughout adult conversations. At a friend's house, someone might ask, well, where is he now? Did he get caught up in the system? Or an elder in the barbershop? I had an afro, so I had to go to the men's barbershop back in the day. I did. I spent a lot of time there with my dad. Any hoo -ha. Um, <laughs> Where is he now? Did he get caught up in the system? Or an elder in the barbershop might caution. They keep carrying on like that, and they're going to get caught up in the system. So that phrase, caught up in the system, and the worried, hushed tones that accompanied it Used, uh, got my attention. What was this system? Where was it? And why and how was it so powerful and dangerous that you couldn't get out? So as usual, the practical wisdom and creative speech of black people was on point. There is a system. It produces consistently harsh, comprehensive, and relentless conditions. Across the country, a network of systemic forces exerts profound, targeted pressure on millions of black Americans causing real and substantial harm to their lives and blocking their opportunities to reach their human potential. This system continues to contain where people live, it reduces the quality of their communities, and it limits their access to critical resources. It profoundly shapes black people's relationships with the police and the criminal justice system, funneling them into conditions of highly punitive, life-threatening police violence, longer jail sentences, than others would face for similar charges or crimes. The system suppresses black people's wages and reduces their access to quality lending and housing. These, along with other forms of significant economic discrimination, have for decades reduced the growth of intergenerational black wealth to a small fraction, roughly 10%, of the wealth white Americans pass down to their children, creating economic precarity and increasing the likelihood of financial catastrophe. Um, so I just want to give a quick example. So uh, systemic racism is among the most powerful and determinate forces constraining life, opportunity, f and freedom in our country today. It casts a wide, flexible, and often invisible net over black people. It functions more or less seamlessly and largely out of view. The effects of systemic racism are not exclusively or even mainly created by policies that make an explicit announcement of intent to discriminate, but instead by a combination of policies written in race-neutral language whose content is designed in ways to interact with other policies and entrenched practices and beliefs to reinforce negative outcomes. For example, stand your ground laws which extend the right to self-defense into any public space, are written in race-neutral language. But because they hinge on the phrase perception of threat to determine their legitimate application, entrenched and heightened white fears of black people provide enhanced legal cover for whites who shoot or kill black people. Using this, and in fact, stand-your-ground defenses are least effective when black people shoot or kill whites. Three strikes laws, laws that require sentences of 25 years to life for a third uh, felony, no matter how minor the felony might be, have triggered preposterous and non-negotiable sentences for people who were charged with or commit minor offenses. And that's, of course, because they've been arrested multiple times. So they get to three faster than everybody else. Um, so, you know, then I just give some examples of some, you know, ridiculous sentences. But it's the collective effect, this is the last sentence, the collective effect of these kinds of policies and practices is the creation of a normalized, unacknowledged process that produces disproportionately negative outcomes. So, you know, that's, that was the big insight, that I wasn't looking for sort of proof of the old school smoking gun, but that it was an entirely new way of achieving very similar outcomes. No. So 
thank you for that. I think I think that that kind of really um, helps the ground, and then to think about then what do we do? Yeah, that's why we have you, Rashad. <laughs> yeah. no. Well, you, well, well oh, yes, not as a little yes, more. We're not yes, going to yes. leave all that to you. But. Please don't. Please don't. <laughs> yeah, no. Please don't. Yes. Um, I was like, yes. I think Rashad will handle that end of this. <laughs> um, no, but it is. You know, I guess I saw myself also imagining. You know, what makes color of change's life difficult? Yeah. Right. What makes the work hard? What are the impediments that we face, not just in you know, communities that are unfamiliar with these types of policies, but in black communities, right, where, yeah. where it's, it's easy to think that you're working as hard as everyone else and your outcomes are falling short. Either you think it's racism in the abstract, but you can't explain where, or you think, I guess I'm not working hard enough. And you have a lot of people who really think that they have created this world for themselves alone. Of course, agency matters. Of course, personal choices matter. And of course, every group of people has people who work harder and less hard than others. I'm not making a universal claim of defense. But you cannot deny the powerful way this whole interaction of, of policies and, and the implementation of them make it, it is a, such an unlevel playing field, it's a ridiculous conversation to have. So the way I want to respond to it is to give people tools, right? I mean, I'm a scholar, I'm not an activist, I support activist organizations, I support m mobilizations. But my, my lane is s figure out how to get to write and talk in ways that everyday people can understand, that they can use, in, in ways that are insightful and add to the conversation, and also push back the myths that we're being asked to continue to support. I don't think there's a single move in the last 10 years from what I'd call conservative uh, you know, legal actions that don't rely on the myth that systemic racism does not exist. They rely on that myth because if you prove it does, then you have no reason to make the moves they're claiming. They actually don't have any, they can do whatever they want, but they don't have the grounds they have now, which is that people think it's gone, it's over, we did it, we fixed it. So I wanna be able to create the kind of evidence that would make that extremely difficult and allow people to engage on these issues in ways that help their communities. You know, I think that's so in, incredibly important, right? Because I'm sure everyone here has been inside of a conversation where, you know, someone is saying something about racism not existing or um, minimizing the role of race, and it's you're in sort of a, a kind of a frustrating loop with someone, and and oftentimes in those situations, having the right set of tools or language right. or stories. Um, at the very least, can make us feel like we walk away with our dignity, yeah. right? You know, you know, you're not necessarily that you're going to convince someone in this right. kind of current era. Not necessarily that you're going to have a, a kumbaya aha yeah, moment yeah. where everyone holds hands and and talks about that they've been reformed or changed. Right. But at least you walk away feeling like you're ready for the next battle. Yeah. And in so many ways, there's the other side of these debates produces so much content and energy where. Um, yeah folks feel quite empowered and right. bold to be um, loud and raw. Yeah, um, so true. And, um, yeah, I have to yes. tell you very quickly. Yes. So yes. the first time I thought I needed to write this book was when I decided to use all my points to start flying first class. I was like, you know, I had enough with coach. I'm too old for this. I'm just done with, and it was just smaller and smaller and I was going crazy. <laughs> so I'm using my points because I'm one of these types who don't use my, I'm like, I'm gonna keep them, I don't know. You know, you never know. So I started using them and I'd end up in first class sitting next to wealthy white men because they're the only people in first class if you really pay attention. Every couple of upgrades, a sister here, a brother there, and you're always like, you know, yeah, okay. If it goes down, you're in 2A, okay. So every flight, Rashad, every flight, well, what do you work on? So I would lie most of the time because I just knew there was no way I was gonna say systemic racism because I've been doing this for close to a decade researching. So invariably it would be, well, what do, you, what do you mean? What are you talking about? And I once came home and I said to Andre, my husband, I said, you know, somebody needs to write a handbook that I can give out so I can just have this glass of wine in first class and be left alone. He said, why don't you write it? I'm like, come on, man, I don't have time for that. And here I am. <laughs> I was like, I'm, I told him next time, no, make any recommendations, no more books, no more book writing. But it was, it was really that very same thing. How do you leave this exchange with your dignity? Yeah. How do you leave it with, some, with something helpful that you don't have to be personally responsible for explaining, because it's exhausting, right? And politically and socially. Um, I'm going to ask this last question. Then we're going to we're going to go to questions from all of you, and the microphone is right there. And so we're going to get to questions. And the great thing about a question is that, like, just you know, you're a professor, so it has a question mark at the end. 
Um, <laughs> and, um, and sometimes we're in these situations where people ask questions that have periods at the end. Um, and in this situation, we want a question that has a question mark at the end. And so I'm giving you some time to like think through that so that when we get there, we're like, we're there. There's actually yeah. a question. Yeah, There's a question. question. Yeah. So, like um, I do just want to, um, in my last question as we, as we head out, um, to the audience with, um, um, you know, I really felt it was, you know, really important, this sort of way in which you talk about different stories sort mm -hmm. of lead to different um, solutions, different mm -hmm. out, different understandings, right? right? How you can phrase something, right? You know, um, a color change will say things. We get, I will sometimes go through an action or that someone will write who works on racial justice for me, right? And right. and we are um, almost trained because we read the newspaper, mm -hmm. we watch the news, and our brains then go back to saying things in ways right. that are, you know, putting maybe the active voice on the um, putting the active voice on um, the people and the passive voice on the system. Like mm -hmm. black people are less likely to get a loan from the bank instead right. of banks are less likely to give right. loans to black people. Right. So then people are like, what's wrong with black people? Not what's wrong with the banks. Right, right. And right. Um, and so, um, you know, one of the one of the stories that you told in the case study, the story of Kelly Williams Bolar, which mm -hmm. Color of Change did a lot of That's work right. of campaigning around, mm -hmm also um, allows us to have sort of a, a intersectional look mm -hmm. right. at sort of the ways in which harm um, sort of engages from a race and perspective. Right. And I'd love for you just to talk a little bit about that for us because, um, and then as we go to the audience, just to kind of um, help us understand the kind of compounding right. aspects when um, both the sort of impacts of structural systemic racism plays out on folks and then plays out on them um, w uh, with additions right. that are related to all sorts of other identities that they mm -hmm. may also have. Right, right, for sure. Um, and, and also, you know, I think what I, uh, before I go into Kelly, you know, I think that Trayvon and and Mike Brown were also gender discriminated against because black heterosexual masculinity, which is the assumption about their sexuality that's built into this rage, this sense that they're violent and dangerous and going to you know, threaten you, is about a gendered analysis. So if you do it right, it's also intersectional because if they were women, or in, they'd be threatening in another way in another setting, but not that one in, in the same way. So I, I just think it's important to yeah. use gender to not assume it's only gender when it's women. Um, but in any event, Kelly Williams Bolar situation was as much about educational um, control over h higher educational uh, educational opportunities for, for adjacent whites in districts that were just so saturated with wealth, and the lines were so clearly drawn so that 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 wealth would be understood as the property of a small group of of whites. You know, um, that was one piece of it. The other one was her her role as a mother. Right? Was she a deficient and inappropriate mother by being a criminal? So if you could criminali criminalize her rather than understand her as a mother who was trying to do the best for her kids, which is what a lot of her supporters, as you know, cross race even, were very intent upon labeling her, the prosecution was constantly saying she was a criminal first. So you can't call her a good mother, which is already just completely insane as a concept of opposition. Um, but then, the other pieces that were very important were how she n engaged with state resources. So she wasn't just a criminal, but she was a, she was a criminal who was stealing from the society. And so her, her economic dis you know, lack of resources, the fact that these amazing schools were literally closer to her house in West Akron than the schools her daughters were supposed to go to, um, what was, was a part of a whole network of things like signing a form but not getting her the father of the children to sign the form, even though we had no custody rights. So they would just sort of use different sort of fractions of rules to create more and more sort of labeling her in a way that didn't quite make sense. Um, but then the other thing that they, they were really uh, very invested in doing is saying, you can only have one reason for having sent your kids to these schools. So it's either that these schools are better, or there's danger in your community, or there's something else. And she was saying, it's all of these things. It's that my grandfather, I mean, their grandfather, her dad, lived in Copley Township. Why wouldn't that count? I mean, if, if my dad lived in Copley Township and they want to call me a criminal for sending my kids there, I'd be like, what are you talking about? They, they've lived with the dad's some, grandpa some of the time. 
there's some other time with me. So black feminists wrote a lot about these kinds of intergenerational networks of families that help communities stay together, which is not just black folk, mind you, that they were just pathologizing as non-normative, as unacceptable, as a sign of you know, deformity. So those are all of the kinds of things that made it rather astonishing. But I also do a deep dive into how Copley Township was able to opt out of the Ohio State requirement that all public schools be open enrollment to anybody in the state. So you could drive, if you want to drive six hours to go educate your kids, that's your choice, you can enroll. But a very wealthy town said, you know, we don't want to participate. So they found ways to create loopholes. So the, the constant, that wasn't illegal though, right? <laughs> because they make the laws, so they know what they do is actually legal. So those are some of the intersectional components of Kelly's, Kelly's story. So we have to use the microphone um, if you have questions because we're taping and so, um, and we can keep talking and I'll just like let people. Yeah, oh, if you great. have your okay, hand up, okay, yeah, come right on up. Absolutely. Yeah, we have people. Great, great. Excellent. Oh, it's right here by this poll. Yes. Since I'm close, I'll go first. Um, sure. Professor Rose, welcome to DC. Thank you. Um, my question um, is about the place where you sit mm -hmm. as an African-American uh, scholar mm -hmm. and professor at a major university, because as we know, um, you know, looking at a lot of cases of, of folks who um, really get a, a horrific brunt of racism mm -hmm. in this country, but we also have that racism at the highest levels. Right. Mm -hmm. um, we're seeing a lot of that in academia mm -hmm. right now. Um, I left D.C. A, a mile away and went mm -hmm. to Brown when I was 18, mm -hmm. and now I've got, I'm not a professor, but I have a lot of friends who are. <laughs> um, and there's a frequent conversation about mm -hmm. um, the attack on black women professors, yeah. whether they're discussing or teaching about race or not. So yeah. I wanted to ask if you could talk a bit about, you know, how these concepts play out mm -hmm. at that high Across income, class, high right. intellectual level. Um, level and you know, we see DEI mm -hmm. and um, CRT mm -hmm. being criticized. I'm really glad yeah. you got your book out before. Uh, and well, you're in a place after where you can have- a lot have of things and before some other, yeah. we don't know where it well, is. But you're in a city where you can have this conversation still, That's which is, true. Um, you know, a blessing for us. But just, you know, what does that mean when that door of free speech mm -hmm. and analysis is closing? Right. For our professors. Thank Thanks. you very much. And you know, go Brown. Woo, yeah. woo. <laughs> what were you? I know we have this thing at Brown where you, you like say the name of your class and some crazy, you know, like, you know, two, eight, you eight, nine? <laughs> Everyone has like some crazy thing. Every year I'm like, what's the sound this year? They're like, oh, Professor Rose, you're so corny. Um, <laughs> So um, so let me say first that I want to, before I go to the university context, I want to say two things about class. There are a few pages on t explaining why I do not think class alone captures what's happening, and that to collapse it as a subset of class is to do racist harm. <laughs> and it doesn't help us to have what I call solidarity efforts that are dishonest. We have a lot of grounds to be together, and let's just stick with those. And if you can't see how race is playing a role after reading my book, why class is not the, the, the umbrella for what's happening, it's a connected component, but it's not an umbrella, then we need to work on that because then we're gonna be fighting each other, right? But what happens across class, and the reason why I don't have examples of say upper middle class stories is because they don't make the paper. Mm -hmm. That's number one, there's lots of reasons for that. And two, people aren't gonna spread that kind of business publicly. They're not going to tell me, oh, I got turned down for six loans, or I got charged this higher interest rate. You know, I, you know there was a, when I went to buy my, my Acura car a few years ago, some guy who had been on the job two days told me there was a special deal, 2.9 interest rate. So I go to another dealer because they have the color I want. She tells me it's 5% interest. I'm like, oh, is that right? So I said, well, how, well, when did that happen? So no, it's been that way for a while. So I told her about the other guy. She was, you could see she was pissed. That she got out and she was going to give me five. So you do not know. I almost didn't buy the car. I was really about to go across the table at her. <laughs> now, that may seem like a small thing, but you do the math and do that across all kinds of assets. What would be the reason? There's just no reason except let me use her to make money on, for Acura. It's not going to help her paycheck. Well, maybe a little. I don't know. But you see my point. Now, some of it's invisible and some of it is not something we're going to say. But whenever I give this talk, someone has a story. And I was in San Francisco, a guy who was a big dean at a big, big school, medical school, 
said that he had the GI rejection, uh, college letters of rejection during the GI era when his dad was qualified to do all kinds of elements of the GI Bill, the education, the jobs. He had the bank rejection letters for government-backed you know, mortgages with low interest rates comparatively. So all of that, that we need to document. Because right now what we have is these crushing state moments, usually involving the police. And that's distorting our perception of what's happening. It's, it's definitely getting at the extremes. But I'm interested in the normalization that doesn't look extreme as well. But I don't have that evidence now. But that's part of what the website is going to be about, giving people space to tell their stories, to document what's happened, and to make that clearer. Now, higher education. You know, it's a mess for a lot of different reasons, and it's also a beacon we need to defend for a lot of reasons. But, you know, free speech was a, was a baton used on both sides of this political divide. And so we don't even have time to go into all that, but people are being attacked at every level. You know, DEI and all that is just a vehicle for realizing that when people have ideas that challenge the myths and they have solid evidence, it does stymie this, tra this trajectory we're on. So that's why places like Color of Change have tried to change the language of CRT, because people don't know what that is, to things like black history. Because that sounds like a reasonable thing we still need. And people can say, oh, yeah, I guess we need that. So you know, part of it is language. Part of it is getting the academy to be more friendly to human beings who speak a regular English. And part of it is um, universities not trying to take this kind of conversation off the map, because they're also part of the problem. But we can, you can email me, get, you know, we know my brown email address. <laughs> it's pretty straightforward. That was really helpful, thank you. Yes? Hi, Des, the Selick class of, uh, Brown University class of 1986. Really 86. wonderful okay. to have you here. Thank you. A um, couple questions. You mentioned Brown students and the work mm -hmm. they've done with you, and I'm interested, in, and yeah. Brown has such a wonderful population of students, how you've worked with them, and then the intersection with the Center for Slavery and Justice, the Ruth Simmons. Well, I, yeah, okay. Slavery and justice. Well, let me start at the end. I direct the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity. Okay. So, I, you know, we're right next door to each other. And, you know, we have different sort of foci. And Tony Bogues, who's the professor who runs that, you know, does his thing. And we're colleagues and all is fine, but we didn't, it didn't overlap with his center. It did overlap with mine. Um, and Brown students, I mean, what was amazing was that they were so combination of driven and curious, and I said to them, I said, look, this is not a topic you don't want citations for. So every time I want to know a key issue, like school to prison pipeline, I want 30 to 40 scholarly citations in the last five years, minimum. And then I would go check them, and then I would go read them, and then, I, then we'd write drafts of together, and we'd talk it through. We, we had a ton of interaction. This was not like a, hey, do something and Xerox it for me. And they are just, I mean, unbelievable, I have to say. So I love them all. They're all in the acknowledgments by name. So if you want to track them down, it was a tremendous experience. And they were lucky to have that kind of hands-on. I mean, I, would I met with them in different iterations over a year and a half. I mean, that's a long time. So anyway, I'm really proud of them. And I'm, I'm, I couldn't have done that alone. It's just too much. You need like a team of people. That's what I had. Thank you for that. Thank you for giving me a chance to thank them. How are you? My name is uh, Jeff Kennedy. Hi, Jeff. Uh, I'm actually not a Brown student. I think <laughs> you look like you should be, bro. I, I, Can I, we I, just I, make I, you graduate <laughs> from Brown real quick? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, think, <laughs> I think this looks like a Brown reunion up here. <laughs> it is. It I mean, <laughs> my best friend actually went to Brown, and I'm looking around, and I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So uh, let me say this. I, I work on uh, the issue of uh, scientific racism. Mm that uh, a lot of people may have never really uh, thought that much about. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at your book, and you were tying in a lot of different things. So I, I want to put the uh, question mark on my sentence. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I guess it's going gonna, it's gonna to end up to two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one was, was there any particular reason uh, you didn't do a uh, sort of analysis mm -hmm. of how scientific racism mm -hmm. ties everything together? Mm -hmm. And the second was, for Brown University and its, its legacy of eugenics, is there, was there any way that, or did that discussion come up within the realm of writing this particular book? That's really helpful. Describe, I mean, define for me what you mean by scientific racism, because that can mean a few different things. All the way back. So I'll use Harvard's definition. Okay, okay, so all gotcha. The way 
all the way back to the 1600s from right. polygenism mm -hmm. right. to yes, saying there, mm -hmm. that there is white superiority. Yeah, at the genetic level. Of, mm -hmm. The genetic superiority of white folks to gotcha. the IQ yeah. to mm -hmm. how it plays out in the district mm -hmm. with housing covenants, mm -hmm. with education, with standardized right. testing, mm -hmm. with uh, so many different mm -hmm. areas of law to abortion. Mm -hmm. you know, I get it. I get it. I get it. So let me let me tell you. First of all, yes. I didn't go back in that general way because I've already explained I was doing post seventy five. That's mm -hmm. the first thing. The second thing was that I was not. I wasn't interested necessarily in ideas, right? But policies that drew from those ideas, and there are a handful that are going to relate to scientific racism, but they're not as directly connected to lived experience on the ground. So that was the first thing. I wanted to do. What are the four areas? I'm not saying it doesn't play a huge role. And there, I said there's health on the website. Health it gets at a lot of the scientific racism because you're yes. talking about, you know, who, wh what are social determinants, right? Why do black people have asthma? Oh, not because they have bad, cheap lungs, but because 70% of black people live within a mile of highly toxic air, right? So how would that happen, right? That's medical and scientific racism that gets defined. So that's in the website. So I did it in that way, mm -hmm. but what I really wanted was what people I knew could hold on to very quickly. What are, what are schools about? Why are we still in this unbelievable just form of, not just segregation, that's like a, that's like a what do you call it, a euphemism on top of what's actually happening. You know, criminal justice, so on and so forth, wealth. So these felt interlocking and that people could see and hold on to them very immediately. So, and then there's just a limit of time and humanity and like you can only do so much. But the health component on the website is getting at a number of those pieces but not in a fully historical way. There's a lot of good work on that. And we have to get medical schools to teach race. They do not teach they race do not at teach all. Race. They still <laughs> don't. I've gone to medical schools and I've had them say, raise your hands, major full, you know, full professor surgeons, and none of them took a single course on race ever in college or medical school. Unfortunately, I was at Howard Divinity, I mean, excuse me, dental school today mm -hmm. getting some work done on my teeth, and you thought I was given a lecture by the by some of the conversation that we were having. I know, you professors. were. You were giving an eye-opening, brand new yeah. lecture 101. I know. Yeah. Trust me, I'm with you. Thank you for Thank that. You so I appreciate much. that. And the second question was around eugenics at Brown University. Oh, I, you know, I that you know, I didn't do anything related to Brown. That's not how I, I... I like... My whole thing is, look, Brown is just as bad as any other place in the Ivy League, but I think our energy should be spent where most black people are, which is not brown. <laughs> so, like, I'm interested in where everyday people are trying to survive. Like, I'm not worried about the people who get through brown. So, I'm just, we'll be all right. We should, we should, we should get the folks in the world world hooked up, and then I'll be happy to turn to brown and start another, another to do. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't go to brown either. <laughs> um, I've got a meta question for both of you. Oh, okay. How is it that so many bright, highly educated, kind, decent white Americans, mm -hmm. even in a city like this one, which right. until recently was predominantly black, know so little about the details you just discussed that are utterly pedestrian in our community? Mm -hmm. You go first. I've been answering every. I'm well, this is your book tour. This oh, is I know it's my book tour, but you're you're involved, yeah. <laughs> and that was a two-person yeah. question. You'll leave something for me, I'm sure. Always, always. <laughs> Not um, worried. <laughs> you know, I I mean, my you know, you, your work is so much at the intersection of ideas and analysis, and my work mm -hmm. is so much at the intersection of analysis and action, and, action, right. and so I oftentimes go to incentive structures of what is required, what is rewarded, where there are consequences. And then when there are not those things in a society, people can, um, people can do all sorts of things that they want to do. And, um, and we do have a society where there is not um, a requirement and there's not an incentive for um, people to actually have to know um, anything about black people to be successful mm -hmm. in some ways, right? Like um, a, a black person has to know a whole lot about white people and how white people and how white communities operate to move through the world in certain ways and at a certain level have to become a deep expert in, in order to sort of navigate, be safe, um, um, kind of um, 
just operate. Ensure, ensure the rewards of what they're doing. Of, of what right? society, yeah, right? right? Like what to make normally. to make this idea of like the rewards of what democracy and free markets right. are supposed right. to produce. You right. have to actually be an expert, and um, and what I'm always very aware of in the work that I do is how little is required of white people. Now, there may be folks who do the extracurricular, and there are people who do the Definitely. extracurricular, right. and go deep and become experts or just know a lot more, yeah. but, the, but the incentive of having, um, of having to know anything is just not there, and the consequences of that yeah. um, are not there. And so as a result, we don't have a society, and that at every turn, um, racism, and is rewarded and is profitable um, from, and so institutions and individuals can benefit and are rewarded for racism. We, we, do, just, we do just have a, a system that if we don't disrupt it and create consequences, if we don't think about our advocacy as, um, as structural mm -hmm. um, advocacy of like making interventions at the structural level, mm -hmm. if we don't find ways to raise the floor on what's acceptable and push up the ceiling on what's, right. what's possible, shifting the window, like we end up kind of running around in circles. And so right. um, I, 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 I fundamentally, um, and I think that the final thing I'll just say is that, you know, um, 2020, when many people thought the best we could do in terms of activism was clap outside of windows, mm -hmm. right? And then the, yeah. and, and there were sort of a whole lot of people looking at screens. Um, and the murder of Ahmaud Arbery, um, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, right. led to like an incredible amount of activism. People were asking questions about redlining and questions about mm -hmm. all of these things. The backlash becomes, let's ban any, 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 any education, any acknowledgement, because we have to go back to keeping the incentive structure in place because a disruption of that incentive of not, because once people know and have to go deep, then the, what the decisions that end up getting made, and that's why what right. you're doing and what this book and that um, yeah. offering of um, ideas to analysis is so incredibly important so that analysis to action is informed by a deeper understanding. Thank you. I'm glad we're paired. I like that. Um, so this is, this is a really good question, and it's it's a very um, a hard one because, you know, if you think that good people are in every group of human beings on Earth, then it's hard to make these kinds of you know aggressive you, you know, unilateral claims. There's amazing people in every group. So I want to take a different word than incentive and push and use it in, use that concept a little bit differently. I think that whiteness is, a, is an identity we structure, we create. None of these identities exist in nature. <laughs> we create them. And the creation of whiteness is the creation of this absence of understanding and knowledge. That is what whiteness mm. is about. Mm. When it's working well, it's mm. open-hearted and naive because that naivete is the only way you can stand in front of this kind of situation if you are the open-hearted person that we're saying one might be. So whiteness is an, a, a hidden identity for whites. Black people have the exact opposite relationship to racial identities because you have to know what you mean to this group in every possible situation. That's what Rashad was referring to. So when you educate whites about whiteness, they're pissed. I have met a person who has been like, man, this is... What? You know, so now that's what they're really against. They're against angry white people, not angry for you know, the wrong reasons, but angry for the reasons that I think they should be angry, which is that they're being duped about what has happened and that they're actually in their name, a whole new system of deep, you know, impenetrable forms of discrimination are being built in, in a new way, not a Jim Crow way, which we can all usually on the liberal to progressive spectrum agree was problematic. It's not like people are defending you know, colored water fountains, This not most people. More than I thought I discovered <laughs> over the last eight years. But so I think that's part of why I think we get caught up. And when they turn, this is the other thing that's happened. Remember I said the, the narrative of what is racism gets narrower and narrower. It becomes personal belief. So here's what happens. You say, I believe in racial equality. Everybody I know believes in racial equality in my all white world, which I don't really notice is all white until I bring in one person of color and then everything's all topsy-turvy. Um, and then I say, well, well, 
you know, um, I'm not racist, my community's not racist, so the country's not racist. People just elevate right up. So remember that whole brouhaha, is America racist? Everybody lost their minds. I'm like, why is this even a question? You know, because they're identified with the country. We can say the country's racist and we can still be patriotic and try to defend things about democracy. That's very difficult to do when you're in this sort of advantage structure. So what we have to do is redefine whiteness, really, but that means you first gotta educate people on how these categories came into existence and what work they do. And that is just what, it, that's what's under assault. That is really exactly what's under assault because that's where the progress was being made. Because nobody in activism, to me on a progressive scale, or very few, don't want a multiracial movement. We all want that. that. Nobody wants just black people getting advantages. We just want a world that is possible for people. And we know that everyone has, more people have to be on board from all these groups in order for that to happen. Thank it's you. a great question, thank, thank you. you. That was a great answer. Thank you. Um, in, in part, it's an answer to my question, or maybe the lecture I'd like to give. Um, but in my working life, my career, I worked in the federal statistical system, mm. uh, documenting disparities in health and social determinants. Mm -hmm. And in doing that work, uh, we were required to use certain questions uh, it's the questions most prominently are used in the census, and there are two, one on race and one on ethnicity. Mm -hmm. The good news is that that's going to be one question, I think, in the next census. So things are changing a little bit, but the problem I had with it is that these questions, uh, you have to answer the questions in the census. That's the law. And so you have to answer, are you white or black mm -hmm. uh, or Asian mm -hmm. or uh, Pacific Islander or something? Right. Uh, and you have to answer whether you're Hispanic or not. That's mm -hmm. the law. And so the government requires you to make this choice and requires the federal officials to report their data, to collect it and mm -hmm. report data on those categories. I presume you use those data, so I wonder if you would Mm -hmm. comment on how yeah. useful you find them mm -hmm. and how you feel about their production and, and your use of them. Yeah, wow, that's a great question. Are there, how many people are in line? Because we're almost, we're at eight, yeah, are you the more. last one? L let me take yours real quick and then we'll, you know, we'll wrap it up. I won't forget yours, I promise. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, I think, mine is, I think mine is a little bit quick. I'm a real estate reporter uh -huh. and I flipped straight to the part of your book about real estate. So I'm going to read the rest of your book. So the okay. answer might be in there. And you did a fantastic job of describing the macro level forces, which a lot of people have never done before. I was wondering in your research, did you come across the impact of food deserts? Yes. <laughs> you know, I mean, look, I, you know, really, it was like, I could have just written one page. It's every goddamn where, trust yeah. me. <laughs> you yeah. know, the book is like two pages, you know, but I, you know, I decided I can only, because I wanted to do such a deep framework, I had to limit the the range right. with my hopes that people in all these areas would say, oh, I found one new tool or a half a new tool or a new way of avoiding siloed thinking to show how nutrition and access to food. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's not just food deserts. It's fast food right. cornucopias yeah, yeah. and food that will help you survive deserts. Nutrition deserts, yeah. I mean, it's unbelievable. We're killing people. I mean, if you really look at what's in fast food, and it's like a, a festival on television of you know just luring you into the worst possible things to eat, and they're ultimately more expensive than actual food, yeah. even though they're they're not that way. So yes, I'm aware of food deserts. We changed the uh, there's a new phrase instead of desert because that sounds natural, and there, we call them food. Oh yeah. Oh, hold on. Um, food apartheid? No, no. There's another there's another word so that it's clear that this is planned. It's not. Like, you know, it's a desert. Oh, I guess there's just sand now. You know, it's not that. Right. Um, but I can't think of the name of it right now. But thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Appreciate it. Yes, this place? gentleman. Yeah, I got you. I didn't forget. Yeah. Um, so uh, two quick things. Um, all of these categories are, pro are problematic, right? They're all, they're all shaky in many ways. But there are three things about ra race is not ethnicity. So that collapse is not helpful. There are Hispanics who are white, Hispanics who are other colors, and those who are black. The Hispanic is not a racial category. And it, ask people who are, who are black and Dominican, 
versus asking people who are white and Puerto Rican, and then you'll, it won't take you long <laughs> to start sorting out what a different kind of relationship they have to whiteness and to blackness. So that is an important thing to sort out, that they're really not the same thing. Um, they matter, but they're not equivalent. The second thing is, if you have resources that are um, arranged by race, and they continue to reflect, generally speaking, the descriptions of different groups that have persisted, then you can't change the census unless you're gonna change the system inside which the census exists. So what makes me upset is that the only group that gets dispersed in this movement are black people. Because we're not all black, you're not, we're gonna mix you, we're gonna define you out, and then we're not gonna have what? The resources that come from the government. I know you have more census related stuff, so I'm gonna just stop there and say that my concern is that the categories are not well analyzed, and then they carry so much weight around distribution of resources, political representation, and so on. Yeah. Um, so first of all, can we give Trisha just another like, appreciation? Thank you. Dr. Like, um, I am so appreciative for your work and your contributions and the way that you continue to push and challenge us and provide the sort of tools for us, um, like I said at the beginning, to um, do better and be better. Um, Trisha's gonna be here to sign books and, um, and so that's, that's gonna be really great. Um, Politics and Prose team, thank you very much for um, this conversation. And for yes, and for all of you um, turning out. And then just um, any final words on the website and the tools and sort of the ways for folks to sort of continue to engage with this work and to continue to engage with the sort of path forward. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Rashad. Um, so I mean, you know, obviously there's the general like, hey, buy the book, tell your friends. You know, <laughs> there's there's always that. Um, but you know, also I, I'd love for people to think about how they can use it, you know, because it's not it's not helpful to me if it just becomes a cool book that kind of goes on a library shelf. I'd be really interested in how where it works, where it fails, what's really missing that should be present. My hope is that if it stays alive in the market, we could do new chapters. It wouldn't be just Trayvon and yes. Mike Brown, but like new things that might be more in a different position with different relationships to the to the key issues and policies. So I'm really eager about that. The website that we're almost done with, we just need like one more round of grant funding, so just say prayers, um, is really about people who are, you know, first of all, only a very small percentage of Americans read whole books, and certainly ones like this. Very, I'm not even gonna tell you how many be too depressing. Consider it a smaller number. And my concern was like, I wanna reach people who are not gonna sit and go find a fairly complex book and want to engage. So this is a website where people follow a black family and they follow characters and they try to figure out, well, what happened? And then you realize the grandma has breast cancer and she has a safety net hospital that missed the diagnosis. And then you can dig down into a key issue and get citations and narrative and description of what that's about. So there's no question that I didn't make it up because <laughs> that's my whole thing. They're gonna say I made it up. Um, and so you have this interaction piece, you can, you can play with it, you can send it to friends, you can develop, you know, so there's some art and cultural moments, you can hopefully, if we get enough money, create pastiches of sort of collages. So the African American collage is an aesthetic and political driving framework for making a story out of a myth, telling your story out of a myth. And so that I'm really hoping uh, will be out before the end of this calendar year. Uh, and that, that I'm really excited about, but it's really a, a partner with the book. They're sort of under an umbrella of a larger project I call, you know, the How Systemic Racism Works Project. The book is the book, and then the web experience is the web experience. And then maybe learning modules if I live that long. But, <laughs> but I mean, you know, I just at some point I have some other books in the, in the mental hopper. So I'm gonna have to leave that, put that down and leave it to you. Because I really see this as a baton toss. You know, and there's so many ways I'm hoping we can, we can just keep pushing because it is ideological. We're being trained into being the people that we don't, none of us, me included, want to be. Amen, and thank you. <laughs>